the change in my life, and I've, I'm 57 years old, and I, I've never said this, um, never put it so dramatically. I don't believe in being hyperbolic. Um, was when in December 2008, the National Academy of Sciences and NASA issued the report that you mentioned about severe, the effects of severe space weather. And in that report, um, they concluded that 100 to 130 million people in North America alone could be without electricity for months or years as a result of... Wait, um, how many people? 100 to million to 130 million. Basically, the Northeast, the Midwest, and the Northwest are directly in the line of fire from a solar blasts or coronal mass ejections, as they are known. Northeast, Northwest... And Midwest. So you're talking about over one third the entire American population. Yes, and that's just looking at the consequences for the United States and Canada. You know, uh, the rest of the world would, of course, not be immune. Um, and no electricity, as is forecast um, to be the result of these coronal mass ejections, um, would mean not just no telecom, but no water or elect or gasoline because the pumps are electric. No refrigeration. Um, basic law enforcement and military security would be compromised. Electricity is the cornerstone technology of contemporary civilization. <laughs> Everything plugs in, um, and without it, uh, especially for a period of periods as they say of months or years, um, civilization could well be brought to its knees. This is it, it, one cannot overstate the seriousness of this matter. Um, now, when I first heard about this, I thought, well, this is one of those um, hypotheticals that scientists like to toss out because it's it's dramatic. It also tends to gain them funding. I don't mean to be cynical, but we all you know have to make a living. Um, so I thought, okay, if a blob of the sun falls and hits the earth, it's bad news, right? Is that what you're talking about? And no, they were very clear that... Um, Coronal mass ejections uh, that occurred in 1859, which is known as the Carrington event, and 1921, the great magnetic storm, as they now call it, in 1921, were they to occur today, we would be looking at the worst case scenario I described. Um, we didn't; they caused relatively little problems back then because there was no power grid in 1859, nor was there one in 1921. There was a, a Society had been largely electrified, but each city had its own generator. You didn't have mega voltages whizzing around the, the grid as you do these days, and transformers being the vulnerable points, you didn't have transformers. So this is a, a, an astonishingly scary scenario, particularly given that the next climax of solar storms is by uh, scientific consensus due in late 2012 or early 2013. Now, that doesn't mean that's when it's going to happen. I and mean, space weather is like Earth weather in that it's, 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 it's very hard to predict. I mean, it's just it's a science in its infancy, and even um, earthbound meteorology, which is not in its infancy, still gets things wrong lots of times. But we do know that the sun ebbs and flows in 11-year cycles, and the next peak of that cycle is late 2012 or early 2013. Now, there are scientists who will jump in right now who would say, yes, but the current cycle that we're in is remarkably low, and therefore we needn't worry about the next peak. Well, that's wrong. If you were to look at the, the cycle that led to the 1859 blast, the Carrington event, which is the mother of all blasts, the largest one in recorded solar history, um, the largest one we know of, it, the cycle was almost identical to ours now. You don't need a, a big cycle. You just need one big storm. You don't need a snowy winter to have one giant blizzard. Um, so and anyone who wants to lull us into a false sense of security because the, the current cycle is, is, is lower energy than some that have been previously is doing a disservice, a grievous disservice. Um, when I, I first started writing about this years ago, and um, you know, faced my fair share of <laughs> derision or skepticism, and whatever it's you know it's 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 part of the job, it's part of the course. That changed quite a bit in uh, June of last year when the United States House of Representatives 
voted unanimously to take the steps necessary to protect the power grid from solar storms. Now, those folks won't cross the aisle to perform the Heimlich maneuver. And so when <laughs> the Democrats and Republicans get together and vote unanimously to do something, you know, it, it's, it's something to take note of. Of course, you know, in the bizarre ways that Washington works, the Senate um, stripped out all language re- regarding the power grid and solar blast, stripped it right out of their bill. Um, so we never got um, where we needed to go. An odd circumstance that, where the House is unanimous and the Senate wouldn't even consider it. We could get into the theories as to why and how that happened. And, um, I'm not a Washington insider enough. No, to no, I, I don't care. This program it does not care about the opinions of politicians. We do not hold them in high enough regard to respect their opinion. We care about the science, all right? Okay, well well put um, and understood. Um, I did manage to attend a, a 19 nation summit conference held at Parliament in London where um, I was impressed, remarkably impressed with the level of the scientific work and even the, the level of the, the politicians and the bureaucrats who attended, but was we were all pledged not to discuss uh, any of the details of what went on at that conference. Um, it was two days. It was remarkable. Uh, it was incredibly scary. And all I can say is, and I mean all I can am able to say is, in my opinion, pray. Um, there are, what's, what's maddening about this situation is that there's apparently a way we can protect ourselves. This is not just a prophecy of doom. Um, just as you use surge suppressors to protect your computer or flat screen television from power surges, it's a very common thing, and now they're usually built in, but you might have one, one of those strips where you plug into. So I'm sure most listeners would be uh, familiar with this little bit of consumer technology. We can protect the power grid but with surge suppressors. Let me describe to you basically how it works. It's pretty simple. A blast issues from the sun. Usually the northwest quadrant of the sun is where we have to keep our eyes on. It just so happens that that blasts that come out, sunspots that occur on the northwest quadrant and blasts that come out of those sunspots on the northwest quadrant tend to hit the earth. Not sure why, but that's that's where we keep our eyes on. Get hit by a lot of these, and normally um, the radiation, it's a big plasma blob flies, takes a couple of days. Um, flies through the vacuum from the sun to the earth and is channeled by the earth's protective magnetic field into circles around around the earth. The Van Van Allen radiation belts are those protective magnetic spheres that keep the, the radiation from coming down to the surface. Every now and then, a blast is big enough, such as the one in 1859 or the one in 1921, to crash through this protective magnetic shield. Uh, the shields are down, Scott. <laughs> uh, that happens every now and then. The shield simply can't hold the, to take the impact. Um, what happens then is several volts per square meter of, of direct electricity go into the ground. It's not, not enough to harm us bodily in any way. But it goes into the ground and then comes back out, comes up and fries the transformers, which are the nodal points of the grid. If I had to say, the the weak point of contemporary civilization are the transformers that hold the power grid together, because these things operate at extremely high, high uh, fine tolerances, and they can be disrupted even by just a couple of volts of, of direct current. And disrupted means not just that they flicker on and off. The copper windings of these transformers fuse, and you can't just send out a utility crew to repair them. You have to replace them. This is a problem because they weigh over 100 tons apiece, the, the, the large ones, the ones that would do the most damage and the ones that are also the most sensitive to these impacts. They weigh over 100 tons apiece, and on the current world market, there's a three-year waiting list for them, and none of them is made in the United States anymore. And to make things just a bit more dicey, you can't. we couldn't launch a crash program to just say, let's make... A thousand transformers and warehouse them somewhere. 
and then you know to protect ourselves as needed because each one is 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 programmed and constructed to the particular point in the power grid where it's going to be used. So it's not one size fits all, unfortunately. What makes things, um, if you're if if you, you have a absurdist sense of humor, funnier, is that the the electrical power, the magnetic field that's protecting us and protecting our power grid has just developed a gigantic pole to equator breach there's a gigantic hole in the earth's magnetic field now this is not according to larry joseph who heard it on some very you know sly source this is according to a squadron of five count them five nasa solar research satellites called themis t-h-e-m-i-s december 2008 they flew unexpectedly through this giant hole. They, they saw the, the, the magnetic field's density drop by 90%. The project leader for NASA on this was so astonished, and this is a, this is a quote, he said, it was as though this, the this, sun... This re, this re, you realize what you just said rewrites all nuclear physicist projections and mathematical equations on this. He was, yes, I, I know. It was, it was so shocking that he said... It was as though the sun rose in the west. And recall that they had five satellites to returning the same data. So it wasn't just wonky, one wonky little satellite. You know? I mean, it was five of them. And uh, it, it was that shocking. Uh, the project leader, that was a quote in uh, science at nasa.gov. You know, um, remarkable, remarkable little article. Remarkable also that it hasn't been picked up more. But, um, you know... That's another discussion, the psychology of, of, of absolute terror and major events. But um, we have, a, we have a, a very, very precarious situation because we're, we're definitely headed towards the climax of the solar cycle, again, late 2012, early 2013. The magnetic field that's supposed to protect us from storms that will issue from the climax of this cycle is inexplicably down. We have a power grid that is not only vulnerable, but that becomes more vulnerable with each passing year because we run it at higher and higher voltages, which means the transformers operate at finer and finer tolerances and are therefore that much more vulnerable to, to these blasts. We have a solution. Um, and one of the things that was noted, uh, noted in the U.S. House of Representatives bill was they came up with an idea to pass the cost along. It would cost 5 to $10 per household per year to protect the power grid. Um, not insignificant, but not that much, given what we're facing. And we have a technology that we, we believe will work, sort of just a, a surge suppressor the size of a washing machine. You know, I mean, it's, it's a crude assessment, but that's basically what it is. We need 350 of these spread around the grid pretty quick. And um, we're not getting anywhere. Uh, we have valiant people trying both scientifically and in terms of the politics to do this, to save us. 